1975, second-year driver Tom Sneva was making a strong impression. Starting from the inside of the second row, he held his own, running in the top five for much of the race. But on the leader's lap 127, Sneva's race came to a spectacular finish. Amazingly, he walked away from this accident with minor burns and went on to become one of the major crowd-pleasers at Indy. Hello, I'm Bob Jenkins. With an aggressive racing style and a quick wit to go with it, Tom Sneva made his Indianapolis 500 debut in 1974. From his dramatic first qualification in the rain to becoming the first to officially break the 200 mile an hour barrier to winning the race in 1983, Sneva displayed an ability to get the very best out of his equipment. And though his efforts sometimes led to metal bending results, Tom earned his place as a legend at the Indy 500, a race for heroes. Tom Sneva was a teacher and assistant high school principal in Spokane, Washington, when he began racing stock cars in 1969. The next year, he won the Canadian American Modified Racing Association title, a racing circuit that developed the likes of IndyCar drivers Billy Foster, Art Pollard, Jim Malloy, Dick Simon, and many others. Sneva quickly progressed to IndyCar racing in 1971 and made his first appearance at the legendary Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1973. We were plenty apprehensive at, the, at that time, and, and I think it only got worse because then I remember the first time on the racetrack, and we went out and did uh, what seemed like, you know, 500 miles, but actually was probably five or six laps, and uh, came back in and, and thought I was really hanging it out and, you know, was sort of happy with the, the effort that I gave it. And I came back in and... Uh, and and ask them how fast we went. They said 150 miles an hour. Well, that was wasn't what I was thinking of because at that time everybody was running around 180, and I, I you know, my arms were fatigued, my forearms were tired. I, I thought I was on the ray, that fine line, that ragged edge, and I'm 30 miles an hour off the pace. And this is the first. This is after the first time off the racetrack, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe we better go back to Spokane, Washington, and practice up a little more. This might be a little more serious than I was thinking. Driving an old car on a shoestring budget, Sneva managed to pass his rookie test in 73, but did not qualify. Perhaps it was for the best. The 1973 race had its share of disappointments, with rain delays, several accidents, and finally a rain-shortened finish for winner Gordon Johncock. It was a tough year, even for the established veterans. Sneva picked up a ride with car owner Grant King for the 1974 season, and when the month of May came around, he was ready to make the show. The first day of time trials produced limited action due to several rain delays. With the winds gusting and rain threatening again, Sneva made his initial attempt. His first three laps were very competitive with speeds nearly 185 miles an hour. Heading into turn two on his fourth and final lap, it started to sprinkle, but Sneva didn't let up. Taking the checkered flag in the driving rain, he completed the run and qualified in dramatic style. Qualifying at Indy the first time might have been the most emotional thing that I've ever done, you know, more so than the first 200 mile an hour lap and then more so than actually winning the race. I think that first qualifying, uh, effort was was something that I'll never forget. Race day morning at Indy can be pretty intimidating for a rookie. There are fans. Balloons. Gentlemen, your attention, please. An enormous crowd and a long dramatic wait for those famous words. Starting in the eighth position, directly behind 1969 winner Mario Andretti, and next to 68 winner Bobby Enzer, Sneva kept his focus. J. 
Steve Boyd filled an early lead. Sneva kept pace, moving up to four spot after 20 laps. As Foyt, Bobby Enzer, and Johnny Rutherford fought for the lead, it became apparent that Sneva's car couldn't keep up. He dropped out with rear end failure after 94 laps. Johnny Rutherford, who started the race 25th, took the checkered flag for the win. But Sneva's performance was not overlooked. He caught the attention of car owner Roger Penske, who was searching for a potential star. Sneva finished the season with Grant, but signed with Penske for the 75 season. I was a little surprised, uh, you know, and then when he said, uh, you know, he'd like to sign me for, at that time, $2,000. And I said, uh, Roger, I, I don't have $2,000. But uh, anyway, we worked all that out, and he actually was going to give me money to race, and I thought that was... Uh, I was a little surprised at that. Tom was uh, someone, Jim McGee and I talked about adding uh, Sneva to our team. He had been uh, very quick in Phoenix. Uh, in fact, McGee and I talked about who would be potential drivers, and we came together and felt that Sneva would be the one for our team. I remember sitting down, and, uh, you know, he sort of told me what he had in mind, what he wanted to do, and I sort of told him what I needed to, uh, to do the deal and what I had in mind, and uh, then we sort of came to a compromise. We did exactly what he wanted to do. With a top-notch Penske crew and solid car as well, Sneva qualified fourth. He would start inside the second row behind former winners A.J. Foyt, Gordon Johncock, and Bobby Unzer. Speeds were down in 1975 to improve driver safety, but the competition was as intense as ever. When the green flag fell, it was John Cock taking the early lead with Foyt, Unzer, and Johnny Rutherford completing the top four. As the leaders battled it out, Sneva remained solidly in the top ten. He was running fifth with a full tank of fuel on the leader's lap 127 when he caught the crowd's attention. Attempting to pass Eldon Rasmussen in turn two, there was contact. Sneva went flying end over end in what looked to be a horrible accident. Helped in part by the newly instituted safety features of the car, Sneva amazingly walked away from the crash with some assistance. The only thought I had, or the last thought I remember thinking, was that I was dreaming I was upside down in a race car. Is that thing happening? I mean, it happened, obviously, real quick. But uh, the last thought I had was that... Uh, I was dreaming I was upside down in a race car, and you know how dreams are, they just sort of fade off, and that's, that was my last thought until, you know, a half hour later when I, you know, started remembering things back in the field hospital, but uh, that was amazing even after I saw the replay because I was really never knocked out, uh, you know, I was doing things but had no recollection of it, so it's, you know, when you go into shock, uh, your system adjusts and blocks some of those bad, bad things out. Sneva finished the 75 season and was running in sixth place at Indy in 76 when rain stopped the race just past the halfway point. Rutherford got his second Indy 500 ring. 77 was the year that the magic 200 mile per hour barrier would be broken. Gordon Johncock was clocked at over 200 during tire tests. A.J. Foyt, Johnny Rutherford, and Sneva's teammate Mario Andretti hit the mark during practice. But when qualifications began, it was Tom Sneva with a first lap of 200.535 miles an hour who officially became the first driver above the double century mark. Finishing his run with a nearly 199 plus average, Sneva was firmly on the pole. It was a very proud feeling, more, more than anything. You know, we were proud of that accomplishment. Uh, you know that there's always going to be new track records and people are going to go faster and faster, but be, to be the first person to run the 200 mile, that magic mark, uh, you know, that's something they can't take away from you. As the race began, savvy veteran Al Unzer beat Sneva to the first turn to take the early lead. Sneva was able to stay up with the front runners and lead the race for three laps. This one turned into a two-man duel between Gordon Johncock and A.J. Foyt. 
with just 16 laps to go, race leader John Cock dropped out, allowing Foyt to take his record-setting fourth win. Sneva completed the 500 miles to finish second. It was his first complete race at Indy. Tom Sneva returned to the Speedway in 1978 as the defending USAC national champion. And as time trials heated up, he was in top form again. Posting new record times for one in four laps, Sneva took the pole position for the second year in a row. Qualifying early in the day, Sneva spent most of the afternoon away from the action as the other contenders attempted to beat his times. Sneva's records held up, but on race day, he spent most of the afternoon chasing Al Unser and Danny and Gaius. Sneva led three laps, but couldn't find the right balance between fuel consumption and speed to catch winner Al Unser. For the second year in a row, Sneva finished second. Sneva left the Penske team following the 78 season despite his success. I guess it just wasn't, you know, wasn't meant to be. I, you know, I had my thoughts on what was good for the sport and what would make the sport grow and things like that. And, and uh, at that time I felt and still do that it was going to take close competitive racing to make the sport grow. And, uh, you know, Roger and I didn't always get along with that theory. Tom Sneva returned to the Speedway to temporarily take the pole position. But Penske's new driver, a second-year Indy performer named Rick Mears, bumped Sneva from the top spot, ending Sneva's bid to become the only driver to qualify for the pole in three consecutive years. On race day, Mears led the charge to the finish line, winning in only his second start at Indy. Sneva, running in fifth, crashed hard into the wall when his rear wing collapsed. He was shaken, but not hurt. Sneva's post-Penske luck seemed to deteriorate further in 1980. After qualifying his number one car, he crashed in practice. He was not injured, but the car was unable to be repaired for the race. Sneva was forced to start from the rear of the line in the team's backup. Even during the course of 500 miles, 33 positions are a lot to make up, but Sneva was up to the challenge. Consistently running six miles an hour slower than front runner Johnny Rutherford, Sneva aggressively worked the field and took full advantage of the yellow caution periods to stay on the lead lap. It was a typical Sneva-style race. Johnny Rutherford led 119 laps to win for the third time, but Tom Sneva completed a masterful driving performance to take second place for the third time in four years. Despite his memorable 1980 performance, Sneva again moved on to a new team. For 1981, he joined Bignotti Cotter Racing. Well, Tom Sneva, he's a pistol. <laughs> For a school teacher, sometimes I wonder <laughs> what kind of school he taught, because when it comes to racing, Tom is fidgety, I would say. He always feels that just on the other side, it's better. And he constantly wants to change the car. Sneva's car arrived late, forcing him to miss the first day of qualifications and costing him a shot at the pole. He qualified on the second weekend of time trials, and when he took the checkered flag to complete his four-lap run, Sneva was the fastest qualifier in the field, but settled for 20th place in the starting lineup. In contrast to the fun and frivolity of race day morning, Sneva got serious when the green flag fell. By lap 33, he was in command, pacing the field 24 straight trips around the brickyard. Still running in the top three, Sneva dropped out just before the halfway mark with clutch failure. By 1983, Bignotti Cotter was a team with some inner turmoil. Sneva was fast enough in qualifications to take the inside of the second row, but race expectations were low for the struggling team.
record setting rookie pole sitter Teo Fabi jumped out to an early lead. Fabi eventually dropped out after 47 laps with a broken fuel gasket as several drivers traded the lead. Rick Mears, Mike Mosley, Bobby Rahal, Al Unzer, and Tom Sneva each paced the field early. But by the halfway point, it was Sneva and Unzer fighting for the top spot. Sneva held the advantage in number of laps led. Late in the race, Sneva led Unzer as Mike Mosley hit the wall in turn one, nearly collecting Tom Sneva. Mosley's crash brought out the yellow caution lights and gave the leaders one more chance to fuel up for the finish. Sneva was first in the pits. But Unzer beat him back to the track to take the lead. Lap 177 as the green flag fell. Rookie Al Unzer Jr. several laps down stormed past both front runners. Little Al allowed his father to pass, but was not as accommodating for Sneva. It got a lot more intense than I thought it was going to get. Little Al uh, maneuvering his way through traffic under the yellow to get in a position to help Dad out. Uh, you know, I thought that was pretty interesting when I saw that whole thing developing. And it got, it got pretty intense, and especially then when we did start to make the move and we were getting some uh, wider cars in front of us than we'd seen all day. Uh, you know, it was starting to get our attention, but uh, finally then we got a traffic situation where, you know, we was able to get a run on it and uh, get by. Finally, he passed the younger Unser. And on lap 190, Sneva regained the lead. He never looked back, taking the checkered flag for his first Indianapolis win. After placing second three times, Tom Sneva finally came home a winner. When defending winner Tom Sneva returned to Indianapolis in 1984, he was the owner of a third USAC national title and the driver on a new team. Working with a somewhat restricted budget but an excellent team, Sneva set new records in qualifying for the pole. His average speed of better than 210 miles an hour gave him the distinction of becoming the first to break two different 10 mile an hour barriers. And it was the fourth time in his career to be the fastest qualifier, tying the record held by A.J. Foyt. It was probably the toughest qualifying four laps, uh, or the most uncomfortable, because the car, you know, you had to fight it all four laps instead of just, you know, run it fairly easily like you can now when the cars are right with, uh, with the kind of ground effects and stuff we have and the tires and things. So it was, it was a good effort, and I knew I had to do that to have a shot at the pole because there was, the competition was real intense that year. The start of the race was intense as well, as Rick Mears got the jump from the outside to the front row. Even the fastest man in Speedway history couldn't quite keep up as Mears and Mario Andretti set the pace early. But Sneva hung on, battling for the top spot, leading the race on occasion as his competitors dropped from the field. Gordon Johncock crashed on lap 103. Johnny Rutherford and Allenzer Jr. were forced out with mechanical troubles. And Mario Andretti dropped out after tangling with Jose Legarza in the pits. Attrition aside, Sneva's car was simply becoming more competitive. On lap 168, while running under a caution as he prepared to challenge Mears for the lead, Sneva pulled into the pits with a broken CV joint. He was out for the day. As with any of his disappointments, Sneva handled it well. I think it's just being very realistic about the activity you're involved in. That uh, you're, you know, it's not, you're not, you don't control all those situations. And uh, you just can't, life's too short, you can't let it bother you too much. Or you're in the wrong sport. With his performance in 1984, Tom Sneva led at least one lap in eight of nine consecutive Indianapolis 500s. But Indy can be a humbling place, even for a former winner. Financial problems forced his 1984 team to split up, and Sneva again needed a ride. For 85, he signed with Dan Gurney's All-American Racers. Sneva lined up for the race in 13th position. Working 
the traffic with his usual flair and aided by excellent pit stops and use of caution periods, Sneva moved up to second place. Running second to Danny Sullivan under the yellow on lap 123, Sneva was ready to show that he could run with the fastest car on the track. But as the green flag came out, Howdy Holmes bumped Rich Vogler, sending Vogler and the hard-charging Sneva into the wall, while Sullivan escaped the incident on the inside. Sullivan went on to win as the luckless Sneva was left to consider what could have been. 1986 proved to be another tough year for Sneva. Working with yet another new team, he managed to overcome car problems to qualify seventh. Rain delays added to the frustration. And when it was finally time to race one week late, Sneva ran into trouble on the parade lap. I couldn't believe that when that car started heading to the inside wall and had absolutely no control of it. And you're on the pace lap and you're thinking, no, this cannot be happening. But it did. And even as it was happening, you're hoping, God, you know, you try to do as much as you could to make sure it hit, didn't hit any harder than it, than it was going to. And, so you're still in sort of shock, but you're hoping that maybe the car isn't hurt too bad, that they can repair it. And, but, you know, that was, that was pretty much a down time. And it was, you know, knocked out of the race before he even got to the green flag. Trying to regain the form that brought him a victory in 1983, Sneva has continued to find the going rough. But he remains optimistic. I think we have some good, you know, some good opportunities left. It's just a matter of trying to get positioned in the right equipment. Uh, with the way the sport is now, it's... Uh, real tough for a lot of the people to get in a position where they can they can put a team together like they want and uh, that'll give them the opportunity to run up up front where you know we've been used to running tom sneva debuted at the indy 500 in 1974 his accomplishments as a driver and as an off-track personality kept him in the spotlight throughout a career marked with much success and some difficult times. I'm not too much into the the history of, of the sport. Uh, you know, I'm more into what is going to make it better in the future rather than, than looking back. Tom Sneva did find a way. Mastering the legendary oval of the Indy 500, a race for heroes.